So let's jump into it. Um, tell me a little bit more about yourself and how do you got into all things tech? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll go in reverse crime. Um, so I'm currently, uh, I run our growth and go-to-market team at Coda. Um, uh, for folks that don't know, Coda is a all-in-one doc. It kind of combines the best of documents, spreadsheets, applications, and, and presentations into like one unified surface. Um, uh, uh, in my role, I run all of our sales, customer success, marketing, um, support. Uh, I run our data science team. Um, uh, I've been with Coda since day one. I was the founding PM. So as we got, got past our 1.0 uh, in February of last year and kind of launched officially, that's kind of when I switched over to the go-to-market side. Um, and then prior to Coda, uh, I was at Google and YouTube for about seven years. Um, most recently as a PM, uh, leading our data and data science efforts. Um, I was also the chief of staff for the guy that ran product and engineering at YouTube, uh, this guy, Shashir Marotra. Um, so Shashir is the CEO of Coda now, so he and I worked together for a little over a decade, which is uh, pretty wild to, to say out loud. Um, and then prior to that, I actually started my career off in finance. Um, so I was in, I worked in FP&A, I worked on a, on a treasury team trading mortgages and foreign government bonds, um, stuff totally unrelated to tech, uh, but still, still at Google. Um, uh, so yeah, the common, the common thread in it all has been, I've worked in productivity tools, you know, since day one, and I've tried to push them to their limits at basically every, every job I've had. That's so cool that you were literally the beginning of, of Coda. So I want to dig into that a little bit more. So how does someone grow from, go from YouTube or Google to studying something that at that point is just an idea? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, uh, it's interesting in my final couple of years at, at YouTube and Google, there was an itch inside of me of wanting to go do something smaller, go, go work at a startup or whatnot. And the, the hardest part I had for it was I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't find a startup that had a big enough vision or that was going to have a big enough impact. Um, and uh, that was the primary context one. Context two was I didn't know if I could find a group of people that I enjoyed working with as much as I enjoyed um, the folks at YouTube, Shishir in particular. Um, so when, uh, um, when we were around the time of, of starting Coda, uh, and looking back at the prior couple of years at YouTube, uh, so many of our internal systems and the way we ran a thousand person engineering organization that had all sorts of dedicated tooling, um, traditional SaaS apps like Jira or whatnot, we used an internal tool called Buganizer um, at Google. But um, when we looked at how we really ran as a team, it was on documents and spreadsheets all day. Rather than going and like buying a new piece of software or building one with a set of developers, we would like stretch and pull Google Sheets as far as we could using Apps Script and Python and whatever connecting to their APIs to get it to do what we wanted it to do as an application, um, uh, which just kind of led to the idea of Coda of, well, shoot, like most of these productivity tools, docs, spreadsheets, even presentations were designed off of physical artifacts from the 70s, you know, and actual spreadsheets that accountants use to, to balance books or whatnot, and not based on how people actually make what really looked like small bespoke applications that they run their team on, their task tracking, their customer tracking, whatnot. Um, uh, so, yeah. This is spoiler alert, but that's like a, the way you describe uh, some companies work is pretty much what I see across the board. Um, people still using, uh, you know, like a shared folder with a couple of spreadsheets and there's no like system of record at least fully integrated and productive. So uh, we were talking about this, like, but it seems like, Overnight, there's this huge trend now for low-code, no-code tools that allow people to collaborate more effectively. Obviously, uh, the pandemic has accelerated some of that innovation. But the reality is all of these tools didn't start in 2020. Like, they've been around for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, in one regard, I think it took a little bit of time for, like, um, the broader technology base to catch up with how people wanted to do things in a browser. Um, but, uh, I also think that there's been a bit of a shift of, um, people recognizing sometimes the way that they're using spreadsheets as an example, um, as being better served by a different class of tools. You know, it, until you, I found that until you point out that someone has a problem, they don't really recognize it. <laughs> um, uh, and they just kind of accept it. Oh, I have to copy and paste my stuff across tools. That's just the way things are. 
Uh, but once they see an alternative, then it kind of switches and they say, oh, shoot, like this is way easier doing it this way. Um, uh, yeah. So give me an idea of where you guys are today in terms of size. Yeah, yeah. So the Coda, Coda team, um, uh, we're a little bit over 70 now. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we, we launched our 1.0 in February of last year. Um, uh, and then that was without pricing. So we spent all of last year kind of building out our billing model and our monetization model. We launched that at the end of last year. Um, uh, today's actually a really fun day. Uh, you can hear me a little bit excited on, on, on some of these topics. Uh, we announced our Series C, so just raised um, around $80 million uh, with a lead investor from Kleiner Perkins, uh, this guy Mamoon, who we're, we're super thrilled with, um, uh, and a long list of angels uh, and other investors that have come along as well. Um, uh, so the next couple of years are really going to be the, the fun part of the journey. Uh, the first couple of years were all about kind of R&D and taking an idea and turning, turning it into something practical. Um, and now it's about scaling it and getting, into, getting it into the hands of as many people as we can. You know, in, in product, we always say that you have to fall in love with the problem and not so much with the solution. So in your case, what are some of those uh, challenges that you are most excited about solving? Yeah, I mean, I telegraphed it a bit describing um, uh, that story at YouTube where um, we had all these internal tools and we chose to kind of build the way we ran the team on top of spreadsheets. Um, it's pretty clear just looking at my background and my history, like the number one problem that I'm always pulled into is this notion of building something yourself. Um, like I find that um, in many cases, rather than me buy a piece of software or use it, I always kind of want to make my own version of it. So it's just fit to what I want to do. And it doesn't come with a thousand bells and whistles that I don't really need or want. Um, uh, there was a, uh, early on in, in um, Coda's history, we were interviewing a designer And uh, one of the questions we ask when someone's coming on the team is like, why Coda? Like, what do you, what's the reason for you to join? Um, and uh, uh, she had pulled up a picture of her office that she was working in as like her reason. And she had stood up and could see like 30 or 40 desks in front of her. Um, and this was at like a, a larger company. So they had all sorts of, sorts of software available. And in every single monitor was a spreadsheet or a document. And it was like, this is why everyone uses it all the time. Um, so like for me, like the problem of build a productivity tool uh, or kind of like this horizontal surface that can do so many things in a way that people can build stuff that replace all sorts of applications that you otherwise would um, be looking for someone else to build. Um, uh, you, you were describing before on like no code, low code. And it's interesting, like my perspective on it is it's not necessarily the case that people wake up in the morning and say, I want to go build an application. Like I don't wake up like to describe the problem that I'm really passionate about. I don't really wake up and say, I can't wait to go build an app. Like I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a new thing. It's more, I get excited by automating something that I otherwise would have manually had to do, you know? So it's like, it's not like a full fledged app that I have to launch, but it's like just a small one that it just does exactly what I needed it to do. And it does it perfectly. And I can make it really quick. Um, like that's, I, I completely agree with you as a product person myself. I've always been uh, lim feeling limited because I wanted to do something and I had to go ask someone to help me. Most of the cases, engineers. I come from an engineering background, but I can't consider myself an engineer anymore. So having the power mm -hmm. to really automate or integrate certain things using uh, forms or visuals, uh, it's really, really, it's powerful. Pa pa powerful to a point that it can be even dangerous because you, you can get to spend a lot of time and like really like reinventing the wheel sometimes so uh, i'm a personal user of some of these uh, out, uh, tools and i i see the value i also think that in the product management world there's a lot of discussions around build versus buy um, mm -hmm. all the time right so hopefully this this wave of, of technology tools allow people to think of SaaS and uh, accelerating the development by buying instead of trying to build absolutely everything in house and not, and forget about you also have to maintain afterwards. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that there's there's a, one of the things that makes it so hard to buy in some cases is you don't need to buy a whole thing. You only wanted to buy a part. Like you only just needed this one piece. As an example, as a PM, I remember um, like one of the mundane tasks that you'd have to do regularly is you're trying to coordinate a group of people to do something. So you need status updates. And it was like, all right, like every morning I have to like ping three people and ask them, hey, can you please update your status on this bug or on this ticket or this thing? Um, or write like a note of how we're doing on this project so I can give the broader roadmap update. And 
Um, that was always super painful. You kind of had to like set a reminder for yourself to go do it. Um, with Coda, um, the fun part is you can set up like, I'll describe it as a bespoke app, like a small mini one where you've got just a table of like every project in flight, the owner for it, set up a pack to integrate with Slack. And then every day it can run and ping a person that hasn't updated like their status column in the last 24 hours to go update it, you know? So like, then it's like fully automated. You turn it on, you can build that thing in five minutes. Um, and now you've kind of taken this mundane part of your product management job and totally automated it and don't have to think about it again. Um, or add your own personal flair to it. Um, uh, uh, Yuki, who I, I think you mentioned before, he's going to be coming on your, your podcast in a, or in, on this show in a couple of days. Um, uh, he, he runs product at Figma and he's always been um, a very uh, prolific source of feedback for us at Coda. Very helpful, um, giving us insight into how he's using it and what's helpful and what's not. Um, and uh, the way that they ran their roadmap meeting, um, they wanted to add an ability for someone to be able to go and like kind of give a thumbs up um, to certain certain projects or certain updates or whatever. So they added a button, but they gave it some like cultural flair where it wasn't just like a single like one plus one. You could actually click it as many times as you want. So anyone on the team could go add a bunch um, and it became like a bit of like a, a cultural expression of their team, which you would never get buying a, a tool somewhere. Like you wouldn't get that level of like, um, cultural affinity into an organization um, without building at least the small part of it yourself, you know? I agree. Um, I see that emojis and this type of small details can can make a big difference. Uh, we, we use some of this stuff on, on Slack and we are also creating our own custom bots to add slightly different flavor to the standard cookie, uh, cookie cutter. And it makes a huge difference, especially now that everyone's working remotely. Yeah. What are other myths and misconceptions that, that you've seen in the pro people who build products these days? Yeah, I mean, I think being a product manager is really interesting. Um, I find that um, the two biggest misconceptions, um, at least when I'm talking to someone that's like new on a product management team or talking to someone um, uh, around career or whatnot, uh, are one... Um, despite the obvious draw of going into product management because you want to build something, you don't actually build anything as a product manager. You're not the one doing the building. Um, uh, there's a phrase that we like to use, which is a PM without an engineer doesn't ship anything, but an engineer without a PM can ship all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, so like, I think one misconception that you kind of have to get through is your job is to help others kind of ship, ship great products, connect them to, what is the desire of a customer? What's going to solve solve a problem and get them to um, uh, get them to build something that's going to solve a job to be done? Um, uh, so I think that's one. That's one. Um, the second one that probably um, stands out for me is um, as a PM, it's not necessarily your job to make decisions. It's your job to make sure that decisions get made. Um, uh, so saying it a bit differently. Um, the role is very much about soft influence. It's about like inspiring and setting vision for a set of people to go build and ship a product um, uh, and do so by um, exploring the right avenues and understanding the right choices um, when you encounter uh, difficult problems. Um, uh, so yeah, so those, those two in particular stand out to me as like misconceptions as a PM. Um, the first one of like, you're not actually building anything. It does mean that it puts like an undue strain on you to like measure progress. Um, there's a PM that I used to work with at YouTube. Um, uh, he was at Thumbtack for a while. Um, and he used to talk, like obsess over his personal to-do list um, because that was how he measured progress. Like otherwise he didn't check in PRs. He didn't make designs. Like the only way he could kind of know like what's his velocity throughout the week is how's he doing in his to-do list. Um, so that was like his benchmark of how do I measure myself as a PM? Um, in terms of output or throughput. So and now I want to learn about you. Like, you, I think your story is, is pretty fascinating because I, sometimes in Silicon Valley, we, we, we hear too much about a software engineer who became a PM, which is great. But I think it's also important to recognize that this is not just, first of all, a Silicon Valley thing or an engineering thing. There are so many different ways you can break into product. So in your own experience, what are some of the skills that you think that help you the most to grow your career? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one one clear thing I'd say is the role, like the PM role, um, uh, can be somewhat um, diverse in terms of like what different companies use it for. Um, at places like Google or whatnot, it tends to be much more um, 
uh, technical, technically oriented um, at other companies that perhaps are a bit more brand forward. It tends to be more about like, um, it looks a little bit more like a GM, a general manager rather than just product oriented. Um, uh, and there's a difference of like consumer oriented PM versus someone that's in more of a B2B or SaaS, um, SaaS space. Um, all of them have, have slightly different flavors, slightly different flavors. Uh, for me in particular, um, uh, I think that there were kind of like three different, um, uh, there are, well, there's probably two that really shine so far in my career. And then the third one, I think is kind of important for anybody, um, to understand and has aided me in my journey. Uh, the first one I kind of alluded to, alluded to it in the second story, uh, just a moment ago around framing, um, meaning that like when it's time to make a choice, uh, the ability to like think through, um, what are the options available for uh, available to you in this choice and like what's the core problem that you're really trying to address um so to pick an example um uh six well i guess now it's about a year ago uh, a year ago we were designing kind of our monetization uh plan for coda like how we we're going to do pricing how we're going to do all this stuff um we ended up doing something a bit um uh, a bit different and unique in that we um we ship what we call maker billing which is when you create a document uh, we only we only make you pay for the person making the document, whoever created it. We don't make you pay for editors and collaborators in it. So think of like Google Docs. You pay for every single person. Every single user has a has a price. Um, uh, so if you have an organization of 100, you pay for 100 seats. Uh, with Coda, you only pay for the people that create docs. So you might make one doc, run your whole product roadmap off of it, share it with 100 people, and they can all add to it, and you only pay for that one person. Um, uh, our thought process on it... Um, to get to this framing, this framing description um, was when we thought about pricing, what was, what was the primary question we were asking? And it was about how do you share? It wasn't what does everyone else charge? It wasn't what's the price point? Um, it wasn't what do you pay for? Like, is it a seat or something else? It was when you share, what does that experience feel like? And we didn't want you to have an experience when you click the share button to have to pick, like, is this going to be paid or not? Like, am I going to, is this a $5 share or not? Um, so that was like a big choice for us. And it kind of comes back to this skill as a PM, which is framing the problem in a way that allows you to kind of see the rest of the board um, and how like this decision is going to play out down the road. Um, so that, that I think is one big one. There's a, there's a phrase that we uh, started using at Coda and a couple of weeks ago, Shashir and I uh, published a doc on this. Um, uh, we call it finding the eigen question, which is a bit of a head nod to linear algebra and like, picking the eigenvalue or like the, the fundamental, um, uh, the fundamental uh, question when you're looking at a problem space that if you answer that one, you'll actually answer a bunch of them together. Um, uh, so that's probably the first skill set is this, this concept of framing problems really well. Um, the second one that I think uh, has, has been exceedingly useful for me and I find that um, it's one that ends up being universally applicable across not just product management roles, but really any role is um, uh, a deep um, uh, familiarity and comfort with data. Um, pulling my own data, um, being able to run my own analysis. Um, uh, part of it is like the technical skills of it, of writing SQL or understanding like what logging needs to look like in order to capture the kind of data that I need to do an analysis. Uh, but also like the inference level, um, the same way that when you're listening to a user in a user interview and you hear them describing their problems, you have to kind of apply a level of interpretation on that to understand what are they really saying? What are they trying to get at? Not just the literal. The same thing is true in the quantitative space. Uh, when you're looking at data, understanding like what is this really saying? Um, uh, how am I supposed to use this to inform our product decisions or business decisions if it's not, if it's not necessarily a product choice? Um, uh, but those two in particular have helped me a lot in my career so far. Um, the third one, uh, which I'd, I'd kind of give a head nod more towards um, folks that are um, uh, oriented a bit more on uh, more business, um, uh, a set of more business oriented problems as a product manager, like if you work in a monetization, on a monetization team or whatnot, um, or folks that are just thinking longer about their career. Uh, I started my career in finance, which meant that I spent you know, however many hours thinking through and working in financial statements and understanding all, all of those uh, aspects of, um, of a company and a business. Um, there was a great NPR podcast a couple of years ago um, when they were looking at um, 
uh, why there wasn't more diversity and in particular gender representation in CEO roles at some of the Fortune 500. And uh, some researchers went back and like looked through um, senior women that had made it to different parts of an organization and how come they weren't picked at the next level. And one observation was they didn't have enough PL ownership. Like they hadn't been in roles that owned a PL the same way. And I think that that as a skill set to learn at some point in your career is really helpful and will allow you to kind of like advance to the next level is being familiar with how financial statements work. And in particular, running an organization where you own a PL, where you own kind of the profit and loss. And because um, uh, that's what, once you get to be, uh, stages in your career where you're running a business. That's kind of like the level of telemetry that you're using to guide it forward. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And then this is something that someone can start today and they don't require um, a full-on career in finance or an MBA or anything like that. So I think it's very important to demystify all of this stuff so people can feel more comfortable with, first of all, what they need to learn and, how, and, and then how to go and, and get it. So and I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up. Another thing, Matt, I want to focus on the future is, okay, these are some of the things that you recognize that help you get to where you are. I'm very passionate about lifelong learning. I think learning never ends, no matter what your degree or degree says. So what are some of the things that you are particularly now passionate about learning and how do you make time for it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's probably two. Uh, so the first part of your question of like, what is it I'm most interested in? Um, or what am I actively uh, working on? I think code is getting to a stage now we're passing 70, um, 70 folks. Um, and in the next couple of years, we should, we should see the company grow pretty substantially. Um, uh, probably the number one thing on my mind right now is communication. Um, I think that earlier in my career, I was somewhat flippant on communication. I didn't, you know, it, it didn't seem like that hard of a problem. Just, just write it down or just say it and it's fine. Uh, but as I've gotten um, uh, further into my career, I recognize how difficult it can be to properly convey an idea that's in your mind and tell someone else um, or translate it in a way that has the same intent, meaning, and context into someone else's, um, whether that's verbal or written or visual. It, communication is just very hard, like as in general. Um, so that's definitely like the, um, the subject matter I'm most interested in learning learning more on and, and developing better um, or developing on. Uh, in terms of how do I make time for it, uh, it's interesting you, you touched on a, um, what I'd describe as a bit of a, uh, as a bit of a nerdy obsession of mine, which is managing time. Um, so uh, I, I, there's a, a published Coda doc that I wrote up on this, um, uh, where I think I, I, I think the title of it is value time like money. Um, for managing time like money, um, where uh, if you think about time as a finite resource and as something that has like intrinsic value, uh, it's very special in that you have the exact same amount of time as like Bill Gates. No matter no matter any distinction on wealth, he has the same number of minutes and hours and seconds as you do in a day. And the main question is, can you use your time as effectively, you know, as at people in different parts of their life or in, in different tiers or whatnot? Um, uh, so the way I think about it is you should be managing time the same way that people manage financial assets, which is they create budgets, they keep track of it. Um, uh, so like, how do you, your question of like, how do you make time to learn the things you want to learn? I start every week setting a budget for my week of like, all right, this is how many hours I'm going to spend with my kids, how many hours I'm doing one-on-one -on -one and team development and recruiting, how many hours I'm doing, you know, catching up on email or team notes or whatever. Um, uh, and each week, at the end of the week, I go back and look and say, all right, I was above or below budget in these areas. This next week, this is what's on the plate. I'm going to set my budgets. And then like, I manage it that way. And I go and make sure that I've got blocks of time for the things that I find important. So like um, myself and um, uh, one of the writers on our team, Erin, um, have started setting up like half an hour to an hour blocks every Friday for me to sit down with her and just, you know, focus on writing or focus on like some part of this um, uh, to make sure that I'm, I'm setting I'm using my time in the way that I'm saying is important. You know, the same way you'd manage money and want to make an investment. I'm making an investment with time and I'm being very deliberate about how I'm trying to use it. A um, friend of mine who's been also a speaker at Broad School many times, uh, Nir Eyal, he published a book called Indestructible. And uh, he talks about time as being one of the, you know, 
most uh, under uh, undervalued assets that we have and how to plan for it. I think, uh, yeah. you know, before you execute, I think the planning piece is so important. So there are no regrets. And I, I also hear in, in product management or in, especially in startups, uh, a lot of people say, hey, you have to do things that don't scale in order to scale, especially at the very beginning, right? When when it's usually, well, you know this, you started there founding team and, and I'm sure that the role that you play now is very different than the role that you play when, <laughs> when you started. So are there any things that you are still doing personally because they're so core to your values and you consider so important that even though they don't scale, you still want to do? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think... The one, the one that's probably true both for my role and for any PM is in particular where you're working on a product that has a set of, um, a set of external stakeholders is spending, spent making, making sure you spend time with customers to do that um, zero degree inference. Earlier when I was talking about um, uh, like a data gene and having a skill with quantitative data and when you're talking with a customer to hear what they're saying and like make your own assessment on it, I think the same is true uh, at every stage of product development of you need to hear from the customer verbatim um, to really understand the scenario, the context, we're at, even though that makes no sense if you've got millions of customers, you're clearly not going to be meeting with all of them, but you should be trying to make space as much as you can to have those touch points regularly. Um, uh, and it kind of, how do you make space for it? Um, go back to previous, previously discussed question of you got to set up time. Like you just got to set up time to, you know, at least two hours a week, spend time with the customers, spend time for me, it's spend time with someone that's just starting out with Coda and hear them hit roadblocks, hear them have issues, hear them, you know what I mean? You want to hear the struggles so you can make an assessment on it. Oh man, I would love to see your calendar. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll very, so much very intimidating. <laughs> so I also want to talk about tools. Obviously, um, Coda is a big part of, of your team's uh, tool set, but are there any other tools that uh, are particularly useful for your teams? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I, I gave the head nod earlier to Yuki at Figma, um, but we've, we've had the privilege of being one of Figma's earlier customers. Um, so we started using them back when we started, um, uh, started working on Coda. Um, so Figma is obviously very big in our team's workflow. Um, we've been a Slack shop um, for a couple of years now. Um, and, and have heavily used Zoom now for two or three years. Um, it's funny, our, in our founding team, a large portion of us were from Google, and we were Google Hangouts um, all the way for the first two two years or so, even though we, we had started a distributed office pretty early. Um, we had a guy down in LA, we had someone up in Seattle, um, and uh, uh, when our um, current um, head of people in finance, uh, Kenny Mendez, joined the team, um, after a couple of months, it pushed us to try out like a new tool like Zoom. And boy, there was some hemming and hawing. We weren't ready to, we weren't ready to switch. And it has been night and day remarkable at, at, um, at some of the difference for it. So we've been, we've been pretty big Zoom users for, uh, for a little bit now too. Uh, us too. Uh, although we, we have to confess, we, we still use uh, Google Meet sometimes. It's hard to get rid of it because you create a calendar uh, invite and it automatically yeah. adds <laughs> that link. I mean, the funny thing is now there's like, it's everywhere. I, I was on Slack mobile the other day and you can hit Slack with a little telephone and a little video and that works too. Um, so there are many options um, uh, that all seem to work just fine. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think are the biggest opportunities for people out there who are building products and they are like, okay, mate, there's so much good stuff out there, uh, tools, support markets, but like, if, if you were, you know, yourself a few years ago, what would be that type of advice that you would give to people who are now starting? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the, like thinking about PM as a, from a secular trend perspective, it's interesting. Um, uh, clearly the, the 10 year, 20 year, 30 year uh, perspective, of, perspective of it is, it's getting cheaper and easier to develop products and tools. Um, uh, and I think it's at like an interesting inflection point of, uh, in particular with tools like Coda, defining what a product is, boy, like if you were to ask some of the best uh, doc makers at Coda about what, is, what does it mean to be a really good maker, um, it's basically being a really good product designer, you know, being a good product, like someone that has really good, strong product instincts and can break down 
what someone's problem is, what a solution would be for that, what's the experience like going through that workflow. Um, so where I'm headed with this is when you think about like product managers and what are the next uh, few years of like, boy, insofar as there's like this huge democratization of product development and being able to create these mini bespoke apps and whether it's Coda or other kind of tools, there are an order of magnitude more opportunities for people to demonstrate really strong product instincts and build great experiences um, in those kind of tools. Um, uh, so I think that's like one, one lens on this is it might be the case that, boy, a lot of people are gonna get an opportunity to kind of, kind of work in that space in some degree. Um, I think the second, the second layer of it's gonna be, um, uh, you might be able to look at the role of product management and like, again, it's this facilitator role. You're working across um, across functions, trying to bring the whole group together in a common vision based on what a customer's needs are. That sounds a lot like a general manager once you add in p &L responsibility or whatnot. So there could be a push of like some of that starts to become a bit more like someone that has a strong product background continues to end up pushing down towards more of a strong GM background. Um, uh, and I think that maybe uh, another twist on this is gonna be boy, with tools like Coda or other ones that help automate a lot of the mundane work that someone does day to day, maybe what it means is for a product management role, you might just end up doing a lot of the same, um, the same kind of feel and responsibility stays the same, but it just happens faster. There's no longer are you waiting for the same full cycle to do the, uh, or, you, or you can handle a broader scope with less, you know, with less work because uh, you're not doing a lot of the mundane stuff all the time. Um, you don't have to wait for two weeks development cycle, close your fingers and hope that the final version looks exactly like <laughs> what you had. On your yeah. Mind. I mean, it's funny. There's, there's one example of it. Uh, as a PM, I always remember you'd have to send out your like start of week or end of week email, which is like the summary of all the stuff that we did. Like, how are we doing against plan? When are we going to ship? Like, what's the progress this week against roadmap? And everyone would send out an email that kind of looks like it's automated, but it really wasn't. They just used the same format every week. And it took them two hours at the end of the week to write. They'd be there 5 p.m. on a Friday doing it. Um, but with like tools like Coda or whatnot, yeah, you can really automate that. And like you can actually have it uh, sent out at the same time based on the inputs in like your task table or whatever. Um, uh, and then you just save, you got two hours back that you can use during the week to do all sorts of other stuff. Um, Anyways, sorry, small digression. Keep going. Yeah, it, it's been it's been great to learn from you, and thank you for your time. Um, is there anything else you would like to share? Uh, no, I mean, insofar as folks um, uh, take a plunge in the code, I'd love to hear what you think. Um, feel free to email me, Matt at Coder.io. I'm um, happy to happy to jump on a jump on a Zoom or whatnot. All right. Well, thank you again. Bye. Take care. Sure. Thank you, Carlos. Have a good one. Bye.